Support for this episode comes from Modern Football Technology. Modern Football Technology provides real-time opponent tendencies and self-scout while eliminating manual data entry into Huddle, DV Sport, and Exos. If you're tired of tools that are time-consuming to learn and perform inconsistently at best, then we recommend Modern Football for a fresh perspective. Schedule a demo today at teammofo.com to see a battle-tested tool that's proven to perform and deliver value. Mention Coach and Coordinator Podcast or use a coupon code CC10 to receive 10% off your first year. And listen to our recent episode featuring Folsom High School Defensive Coordinator Jordan Ersick to learn more about how the 2023 California State Champion uses modern football to dominate their opponents. All right, Lens to Deuce Right Claw, Z Short Lander, Z Strong X Revo, Z Lockback, Canet with Two Jet, Z Monday Astro Reed, and then Alert for Man, Money Deacon Flow F Panama on the Turbo Ready Break, right? And that would be three plays in one. That's the longest it would get. And that alert, sometimes we don't call in the huddle, but we just let the guys know, hey, be ready for Pan- Panama here. And the Rams use different nomenclature than that. I think use the same words that they use, but that's the, the, the length of it. And that's pass can pass, right? Shell versus single high. And then if you get man, we want to do the third play. Welcome to this week's episode of Accelerate Everything on the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. And this series has just been packed full of detail, takeaways, ideas. And we've had from the beginning, former NFL QB, J.T. O'Sullivan, who heads up QB school. We've had Will Hewlett, QB trainer and elite QB trainer, giving his perspective. We had Seattle Seahawks coach and research analyst Brian Ayers talking about things from that perspective. And today we have a current quarterback, John Walford, who was signed by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and has spent time with the Los Angeles Rams and has a Super Bowl ring as well. So tell us a little bit about John Walford. Well, John is uh, an unbelievable talent because he doesn't fit the prototypical NFL mold being a, you know, six foot four guy or six three with all the physical traits. You know, he's 5'11 and he just he just has sustained himself in the league with his mind and his ability to to process things quickly and his mental toughness. And so we kind of go into some of those things. I think you're going to get a lot out of this. This this pod could have been a three part series. We talked for an hour after it was over and I mean, there's so many takeaways here. I'm excited to give you some of the, the, the good nuggets in this show. And that's the idea is we're bringing you ideas that you can take to your team to accelerate everything that's happening for you. Stay tuned at the end for Dub's takeaways from this episode. What you see on tape is a direct reflection of what you teach and how you teach. Video is important, but if you don't teach well, you're not going to like what you see on your video. First Down Playbook has been helping coaches teach better for 13 years. It allows you to present installs, playbooks, and practice cards in half the time with NFL quality. Coaching tools like video pairing, a player app, practice schedules, and wristband sheets have made First Down Playbook a program management system with everything in one place. If you're in a position of leadership with your football program, receive a free one-week look at First Down Playbook. Call them at 512 812- 814-6158 or visit them on their website or social media. Mention Coach and Coordinator Podcast or use the coupon code COACH24 to receive a $100 discount off the normal $700 First Down Playbook team membership price. Links and the phone number are in the show notes. Our guest today is John Wofford. John is currently a quarterback in the NFL for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He previously spent three seasons with the Los Angeles Rams, winning a Super Bowl in 2022. Prior to the NFL, John was a college quarterback for Wake Forest, where he won the starting job as a true freshman. He was also a legendary quarterback at Bishop Kenny High School, where he still holds many passing records in Florida today. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Doug. John, first time I met you was well over a decade at a Darren Slack quarterback camp in Florida, and I think you were in junior high at the time, but I vividly remember your demeanor to this day. You had the it factor. My first question was looking back on your journey to this point in your career, what coach made the biggest impact on your acceleration of understanding how to play quarterback? 
There's multiple. I wouldn't ascribe one coach as the best. My high school coach had a great understanding of coverage. I remember even in that camp, you guys were teaching rudimentary coverage at a young age. And just for me, I was able to kind of grasp what are the weaknesses of cover three and cover two. And then when I got into high school, you know, that knowledge was continued by my high school coach, Tim Krause, who's a great coach. He's the head coach at Bishop Kenny now. And just an understanding of coverage was so important at this position because you can anticipate where the ball is going to go before the snap which has allowed me to play at a high level for a long time. One of my biggest advantages is I I think I have a good, you know, the go, no, go reflex, shoot, don't shoot process information as fast as possible. I've been blessed with the ability to do that at a high level. And then I've always worked my ass off to try and maximize my potential with my arm, right? Because I'm not as talented as a Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, et cetera. So I started honestly with that camp. It was my first introduction to it. And then Tim Krause was great. My college coordinator, our entire system was, designed on, okay, can you understand box counts, how we're manipulating people with RPOs, right? So that you're always getting the ball out to the open receiver, or it's a run play if it's a six box and and they want to play shell. And then you fast forward to the NFL and coach McVay just takes it to another level, right? We ran a a system and, and Dave Canales, the offense coordinator in Tampa is of that tree. And it basically, you go into every game and in almost every single call, has an alert or a, we call it a can in Los Angeles. And you're basically anticipating looks. So you're always in a good play, right? We're not running into an unblocked blitzer, right? We're alerting out of that or audibling, or if they're going to play man, we're getting a man zone tell to get into a good man play. We're not just calling all purpose plays all the time. So there was just layers to it. And I've been fortunate that I've had an introduction at an early age, which starting that process early, I think is valuable. And then I had smart coaches at at every single level and that's i think rubbed off on me john i want to get right to your time with the rams because there's a lot to unpack there you got waived initially and they're on the practice squad at that time you're going against brandon staley's defense i believe he was the dc at the time before he went to the chargers and you're having to emulate guys like drew Brees, lamar jackson along with different offenses every week were there some techniques and tactics that you learned to incorporate in your game by getting reps against the starting defense every day Yes. So I was reading it true. They basically handed up me a scout card and then say, read this how you think they would read it. Right. So, which was cool. It wasn't like I was, you know, Hey, you have to read one, two, three. Uh, they kind of gave me the license to, to decide how I wanted to read out plays. The, the greatest thing about that is I was going against the ones defense and coach Staley's defense and that Vic Fangio lineage is all amoeba make shell look like three we're going to key the back the back check releases we're going to add an extra safety and almost make it like a buzz coverage and it's just great every day to have to make decisions where pre-snap you don't know what the coverage is right it's all post-snap right and that's what a lot of defenses do now at the nfl level is you're not able to get a tell unless you're displacing the tight end and the running back with a lot of these vic fangio s defenses and I think it was invaluable. I think it's my edge at this level. All those reps accumulating, you know, just going against the ones was great for me and, and uh, wouldn't take it back. I feel like the, the Vangio defense is really kind of taking over in the NFL. If, I mean, obviously you're in it, so you know more than I do. Is that, is that where teams are migrating more to instead of just more, you know, cover three, one high based? Yeah, so I describe it as there was that Seahawks defense that was so – lethal back in what was the mid 2000 2010s right and then everyone started running that and then teams started to figure it out and then Fangio came along with the Bears and now there's been a bunch of coaches that have branched off of history and football's kind of cyclical but I think you know the coaches that have an intent and understanding behind what they're doing are, are incredibly successful and you look at like San Francisco's defense which is a off the Pete Carroll tree they're more simple, but they just execute at a really high level. And the way they teach their defensive ends to roll off the ball and blow up the run on the way to the pass um, has made them one of the best defenses in the in the league in the past couple of years. So there's different ways to skin a cat. And Fangio's, I think, is one of the better ones. But it's interesting, you know, the more I think about it, it's like the more teams run it, the more quarterbacks see it, and the more quarterbacks get better at beating it. You know, so not a lot of people are running Fangio. You know, now now some of those defense are, are having good years, but they're not having amazing years. So it's an interesting process. So when you're back there and you're not 100% sure what the coverage is, what are some things visually that you're looking at as a tell quickly as the ball snapped to kind of 
uh, figure out where you need to go with the football, where the space is. If it's third down, we always are getting man zone displacements, right? So we're trying to figure out is it man or it's zone more times than not. Now, some teams don't play a lot of man on third down, so you're just wasting time sending it back. So if I can find that out, sometimes they mask it too. They'll play Tampa. They'll leave the, the, the linebacker out over the running back and then they'll play Tampa. But if you can find that out, great. If not, then, okay, it's some type of zone. I'm usually keying like the, the boundary free safety uh, or weak safety to get a tell. But it's it's that's a starting point. I, I'm, I'm pretty wide with my vision. Um, the safeties are, are the main things. Um, but you're feeling everything like you, you kind of teach yourself to have a wide gaze because you feel a nickel and a safety. Um, but the safeties are, are, I think, for any quarterback, a good starting point. Let's talk about that wide view of vision. Uh, that's something I've done a lot of research on. Is that something just innately you're able to do or do you have to remind yourself to pull out? Is there any strategies used to make sure you're seeing the bigger picture? Yeah, so that's a good question. It's hard to describe what I do. So I kind of visualize I visualize the concept in my head. So when you call these really long plays, you have to do that. And I almost see it like it's happening on the field, like the routes are dispersing on the field before the snap. So as I get up to line of scrimmage, I'm like, I'm picturing like four verts. I'm picturing the scene, the scene to go. And then from there, I, I'm like, right, how am I going to read this? And then I picture, take a snapshot of the safeties. And, and it's a, uh, it's just something that I think I'm innately good at is, is feeling like, you know, a late bail from a corner to throw a hitch if they're trying to, to show press and then bail. Um, and I honestly think it's the amount of reps. I've just played a lot of football. I, I started as a freshman in high school. I started as a freshman in college. And then I've played five years now in the NFL. So the accumulation of reps is what's so valuable. You're in the quarterback room with Kevin McConnell. I believe he's now the head coach for the Vikings and obviously Sean McVay. What did they do to simplify concepts and reads that allow you to find the open receiver better? Is there any, anything that, that they've done to help you become faster? What stands out about those guys? Well, usually oh, they're always trying to get the quarterback in a good play for the coverage, right? So they always want you to have an answer. They don't want you to run, you know, a, a bad concept against man, right? A zone beater against man, right? So, so that's at the base of, of how they kind of teach it. Now, what, what comes with that is a lot of complexity pre-snap and getting into the right play. But that's that's one area where I think they are both elite is getting getting you in a good play against the defense that they're running. From there, you know, as a starting point, they tend to teach pure progression. But there's nuance to that, right? So I think they teach a rookie Newton, you know, basically pure progression, one, two, three, four, five, six. Matthew Stafford, and at the point I was in my career, you know, we had more lens to, all right, let's key the safety. All right, this is, you know, a two high, one high look. So I think they coach to the intelligence of the player and then they have like a, a rudimentary system uh, where they want to get the, the offense in a good play against the defense that they're running. From there, they can add complexity based on the quarterback's capacity. What are some of your favorite things to attack Tampa to? I mean, you know, you have the, the seam stop on the middle, right, where they you know, attack the, the Tampa Mike vertical, getting an empty, you know, sometimes you'll get a D tackle drop uh, if you do do that, but isolating that weak side will high lows on the weak side will away from the turn of the mic, obviously seams away from the turn of the mic are, are good as well. Um, and then high lows, right corner, you know, we have a, a flag concept and then, you know, like a Omaha China or the running an out route and they're wrapping back underneath. All those are good. So high lows on the corners, high lows via daggers on the hook defenders. And then isolating that mic, right? And who is that mic is a lot of that question. Is he really, really good? Is it Fred Warner? You know, not as not as excited about that as, as you would be with any other linebacker. What's it like having Sean McVay talk to you in the helmet between plays? Besides a play call, what information is he giving you during a game? So Sean, so he kind of gets in his zone. And you can feel it when he gets in his zone with play calling. And as you get in his zone, he gets in his zone. Very even keeled on game days. Just, Consistently getting the call in quick because they're wordy. Friendly reminder here or there on like can criteria, but I typically don't want, even want that. I, I kind of know it and I just want to get the call in. But, you know, he's going to talk to you on the sideline if you see something. But a very like steady, even demeanor when he's calling the plays, when he's in the zone, and that's when he's at his best. Let's talk nomenclature. In your honest opinion, 
do plays need to be one paragraph long? Oh, uh, no, no. We have one paragraph plays on some third downs and some early down stuff. You know, like we would have a play, can a play, alert versus man, right? So basically three calls at the line of scrimmage that could get pretty lengthy. You don't need to do that. I, I don't think so. I think teams have simplified that in all of our calls in LA. You know, we even simplified down to numbers if we're going up tempo, right? You know, so so they can be simplified down. And while I do think it's good for your brain to have to picture it and to say Z post X curl Y drag, it's not absolutely necessary. Uh, I don't think you need it. That's my opinion. Let's circle back to can calls. That's something I'm always intrigued by. Do, do you have a favorite pairing of plays together or is every can kind of game plan specific? So picture like a bunch, man beater, zone beater, right? Bunch being like, all right, point man is running like a diagonal route, like a one high man beater across the field. Number three is running like a flag route. And then the outside guy, ideally Cooper Cup or Chris Godwin is running a choice route. Right. So if you get robber and the robber safety wants to double cup, then you got two man beaters with the flag in the corner. Two man, the choice is still good, especially with a bunch. It's hard for them to play trail, um, and he can snap that off in whatever leverage the defense is going to play. So it's got answers everywhere. It's got three good man beaters backside. You can tag whatever you want, you know, go ball or a, a stop if you got a, a dog at, at X. And then get the back out of there, right, to clarify the protection, right? So, if, you know, like have him out wide, bring him down. All right, is it man? All right, I might just scram the protection. Right, just send the back on a flat and have them line up in the Bravo location or in the B location, which is like weak side, run a flat or whatever, get out of there. And then that way, you know, if they want to do these, you know, Mike and the A and peel the guy, they can't do it because the back's displaced. Now the line knows, hey, it's man. There's only five guys in the box, everyone else is in man. Block it up and everyone knows what to do. I would probably, like, if this is an all purpose, I would, you know, can it or alert it to like a, three by one concept point man is running that same kind of diagonal, but he's got a middle read. So versus too high, he can keep it down the middle outside guys running like a seven step skinny. And then the, the inside guys kind of running an arc pivot, right? So that point man's kind of clearing it out. You get a high low on a hook defender and cover three, you clear out the weak side hook defender. That's great versus three good versus fire zone. You got answers with that diagonal and the skinny. Um, and then, Two, it's good because you're clearing out the tempo mic. You still got a high low. Uh, eight, it's good. Same same process. You got a eight. Mean I say eight, meaning like cloud the passing strength uh, quarters backside. And then uh, six, six is the one that it's a little dicey, uh, but you can't. It's hard to have a perfect concept for all. So so what we like if if you're thinking about how we would can something, it'd be all right. Well, what do they like in third and two to five? Well, they like man and they mix in you know some fire zone or something. And then we go, okay, well, what do we like? Our first call is going to be a man call. Our second call is going to be a fire zone call. And it's going to have answers for whatever their third favorite zone call is, right? And that's how they process it. We're going to take a quick time out of this episode to make sure that we share some great resources that Coach Dub Maddox has put together. I know my bookshelf is just full of your books. I've always followed all the things that you do. And you do a tremendous job of just putting together detailed resources that can help coaches accelerate everything within what they do. So tell us a little bit about some of the things you've put together. Yeah, our four teeth is an operating system that accelerates coach and player decision-making under pressure. So we've built frameworks that other experts and other domains have used and put them in a football process that allows you and your staff to get on the same page and accelerate your ability to learn how to watch film, learn how to game plan faster, learn how to play call faster. And with the common language and the non-negotiables that we identify, it really unifies everyone on your staff and your team to see the game through the same lens. And that's really the hardest thing that we have to do as coaches and coordinators is to unite everybody to see that game through that expert lens. R4 is your answer. You can check it out at r4footballsystem.com. As coaches, we know that some of the biggest hurdles to our team's success can come from off the field. Your team needs support to tackle the endless list of expenses, uniforms, training equipment, travel, and more. But raising that money can feel like a full-time job. Thankfully, there's Vertical Raise. 
Vertical Raise is the premier online fundraising platform using innovative technology to create the easiest and most efficient system available. Raise more money in less time with a local fundraising coach who works with your team every step of the way to customize the ideal fundraiser. With options for online donations, digital discount cards, premium product sales, and even spirit shops, Vertical Raise has top-of-the-line solutions for every fundraising style. To find out more, visit verticalraise.com and we'll get you connected with an exclusive offer on your first fundraiser. Do you have a way to protect against, you know, edge pressure on the backside of your keepers? I know keepers are a big part of, of that offense. So if you're, you know, anticipating booting out to and there's pressure there, do you have a way to can can that to something else? Yeah, yeah. Almost all of our plays are canned. So every time there's a keeper, there's an alert on it. And sometimes we call and run it. So if we want to get up the ball and just snap the ball, like uh, change up the tempo on the defense, you call and run it. And we're taught, like, in those scenarios, just have big eyes for that nickel, whoever's going to come off that edge and get some depth away. And, like, those can be good plays, you know, if you can get a slide with it. It's It can be a good call and run it play if you've got a, a quick element throw. Typically a slide is how I would design it if I was just going to call and run it. But we alert away from it. You know, we can run a keeper can – we can run keeper can keeper and you keep away from pressure. We can run keeper can run, you know, keeper can fire. I mean, they're bringing, if they're bringing pressure, you know, it's some type of either man fire zone or, or three fire zone in all likelihood. And you can get in the gun and throw choice and, and get the protection out, get the back out, have the mic push to three and you got an isolated choice route. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that clip with Cooper cup, describing fire zone versus the Jaguars. But but that's kind of what that, that answer was, is, hey, we know they're bringing fire zone. We're alert. Get it out. Boom. So your keeper can keeper call, is that going keeper the other way? Keeper the other way, yeah. Typically out of a balance formation where you can do it either way. Can you give me an example of what it sounds like to call play with a can attachment in the huddle just to impress people? Uh, all right. Lens to deuce right claw, Z short lander, Z strong X revo, Z lock back, can it with two jet, Z Monday Astro read, and then alert for man money Deacon flow F Panama on the turbo ready break right, and that would be three plays in one. That's the longest it would get. And that alert sometimes we don't call in the huddle, but we just let the guys know, hey, be ready for pa- Panama here. And the Rams use different nomenclature than that. Ed Money uses the same words that they use, but that's the 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 length of it, and that's pass can pass right shell versus single high, and then if you get man. We want to do the third play. That's really impressive. Talk, talk to me about your process or system maybe you've developed to be able to consume all this information and distill it down into a way that you can recall it under pressure. Sometimes I would recommend people just, if you're going to use long play calls, have a wristband. We did not use a wristband and, and I kind of wore that as a badge of honor, um, but it requires extra time, you know, that sometimes I think would be better, you know, if I'm being reflective, more well spent watching film or whatever. But it's a double-edged sword, you know. So what is my process? Well, how am I able to consume that? When I call it, I see it. And that's, I think, the most important thing. So you have to understand, like, when you say south right or whatever the formation is, you have to see it immediately, right? X, F, Y, Z, right? And when I'm calling the play, I'm seeing everything. So I can go south right, F flow, past 15 Willie x stroke z locker and i'm just picturing that f is coming in a fly motion i'm doing the play action x z the backs in the flat the y's in pass protection can two jet f choice stucco right choice over here stuck over here and so you have to almost see it like it's being drawn in front of you as you're calling it and it's hard to do under pressure the method i've kind of come up with is i i made voice memos on my phone and then i would increase the playback speed Right. So I would basically read, I'd go through our call sheet and any long call or complicated call with some nuanced can criteria, I would create a voice memo. And then on my car rides to and from work, I am playing that voice memo and kind of running the play in my head and then calling it out loud in the car. Cool thing about voice memos is you can increase the playback speed, right? So I can go one or two times speed. And then that way, it's like the speed of the the voice memo is super fast. So I have to process it really fast. And then when I get out on the field, it's pretty easy. So I, I start that the minute we get the call sheet, I start creating voice memos. And then 
it's also a good way. And this is where I think it, it does have a positive. It's like, I'll just sit in my room at night or in the morning before prep and I'll just play my voice memos. And it's a way for me to kind of walk through the calls, right? Visualize. And then by the time the game rolls around that long call that I said three or four minutes ago, just is almost ingrained because you've taken enough reps. That's a really good method. Um, I think something that, that guys can, can borrow. Next thing I want to ask you is when you're breaking the defense down, watching film, where do your eyes naturally go? I mean, where do you start? Yeah. So I try and if you picturing like a film, there's a back angle and there's a side angle from the side angle. I try to like visualize that I'm seeing it from the quarterback's vantage point. It's kind of tricky to describe over a podcast, but almost like, I'm like moving my vision field to where the quarterback is, even though I'm looking at it from the sideline is one thing that I try to do, especially, and I, I kind of divide my film in passive versus active. And I can describe that in a second, if that's, if that's, if that's helpful, but long and short of it, I'm trying to kind of take the vantage point of the quarterback, even though I'm watching from the, the side view, because the back view, you can't see the corner. And then I'm usually key in safeties, you know, and then obviously like pre-snap if there's man zone tell, that kind of gives it away, but, but safeties are the main thing. What are their common blitzes? It just, I have a kind of a process earlier in the week to get a feel for what the defense is doing. And then later in the week, kind of quiz myself to see, am I seeing the coverage pretty quickly? I've done a lot of research on vision and sports, and it, it's been said that elite performers can recall the fine details of player movements in space. And one practice is that they must write down all those details that they saw in a given play. And they're able to recall a lot when they write these, these things down, can you take me through a play visually that you can remember and, and what your eyes look at post snap? I'm really intrigued by, you know, post snap, what you're locked on or where you're looking and what you're able to see in that sub second environment. One play that comes to mind, I, I, we played Seattle last year. I was playing, this was just a keeper, not a drop back pass. I, I can think about a drop back pass too, if that's uh, more interesting to you. But I got up to the line of scrimmage. It was, we call it a smooth quick, right? Where we're breaking the huddle. We're kind of walking up the line and set up, ball snapped. And uh, and I knew I had to peak my nickel and I was looking at the, the free safety. So I'm walking up to the line of scrimmage, kind of moseying. We're trying to lull him to sleep and then snap the ball. And I just remember going like eyes right to nickel, safety, set hut. I'm getting the ball under center and I give one more peak to the nickel. Nickel's coming. I get extra depth and we hit a 12 yard flat route. And so that, that's just an example of, I didn't have an entire pre-snap, but I'm usually like, all right, what's that weak safety doing? All right, this nickel's pressed. All right, it doesn't feel like man. Okay, it's gotta be far, right? Like, cause it, why is a nickel just standing there like a wooden Indian, you know, and, and they think they're hiding man, but more times than not, we know that. So, and the better defenses now show wooden Indian and then actually don't come. So the scouting, you know, it's like who has the chalk last, type deal but um, but that's one example of, of a play i'm gonna steal that coaching term wooden indian yeah yeah i, I don't know who talked i think that was a mcveigh mcveigh saying but i'm not certain so the rams offense is built off the wide zone the run game what week to week run game adjustments does the coaching staff make to protect that core concept what, were there any specifics that they look at when game planning yeah i think so so we had kind of mid zone wide zone mid zone, a little bit tighter than wide zone teams would play their defensive ends through the chest of our tackles, right? Cause everything kind of winded back and that was the intent of that run. So like a good compliment to that is you'll see like Cooper cup will sometimes we call it a triple where he will triple, he will actually hit that end and work up to the nickel. And it was almost like a combination block that you would normally see with a tight end but because Cooper was such a willing blocker. We were able to run this play. The, the, the uh, Cleveland Browns ran it a lot too, because they ran a lot of mid zone, same lineage, the Vikings, the, anyone that has come from the system. And so what it allowed us to do is then, all right, all right, that, you know, let's say we were normally calling mid zone team wants to play through the chest. We had this compliment where we can now run. It's a wider zone than our typical mid zone. And then we would capture the edge and the intent is to get around the edge of the, of the defense. Depending on the defense, you can get some toss actions as well, you know, where, you know, you're, you're pinning that end who wants to play through the chest. Um, but that's a, a common mechanism that we would see is that defensive end playing thick through our, our tackles uh, to try and stop the mid zone. And you just want to have compliments 
you know, it's like, uh, I've heard this so many times, plays that start out looking the same that are different, right? And and that's what that offense, Shanahan, McVay, that tree of coaches is is constantly thinking about. John, let's talk option or choice routes. It feels like the Rams run a bunch of variations and it seems they're always tweaking. What are some things that go into being able to read and adjust those throughout the season? Well, you have to have a guy. I think that's one of the, the tricky parts is some, you can't, not everyone can run choice and we're not calling choice for a lot of people. You know, you got to have a savvy guy who knows how to double someone up and make a decision and diagnose some coverage. I think Cooper's probably the best. Justin Jefferson, I mean, Justin Jefferson's a freak too. But these elite receivers that have been around have a good feel. I would say it starts with that. You have a pretty savvy guy with feel that can do it. And then, you know, you can't be too quick. One of the coaching points that I think that a lot of teams now do, which is pretty nuanced and, and effective for running choices, defensive back sees you skip off the ball. They're keying that now and they're saying, okay, it's choice. I'm just going to sit. He's not taking me vertical. And the way that the Rams did it and a lot of teams have done it now is they are missing a count instead of skipping off the ball. Right. So, so Turbo said, hut, right, the guy misses a count for a second, then goes, you get the same delay, right? Cause you don't want that. What you know, in choice there's typically like a corner route, clearing it out. And then you've got whatever underneath. And that's uh one of the things that I think is a good coaching point for, for young guys to think about um, running that route and coaching. So let's talk elite receivers. It feels like every great quarterback has a, a good relationship and chemistry with, with that one key receiver. What goes into building that relationship and what are some traits those elite guys have? They always know where to line up. They always know what route to run and they always have a plan for getting open, right? So they're not swimming like, okay, what's my route? All right, I'm going to just run it. Like, all right, how am I, how am I going to beat this coverage? This guy's going to walk up and press me. I'm going to have a plan. I think the best guys have a plan for getting open every route. They mix things up. They watch a lot of tape. They understand defense. They know how to line up. And then they have some freakish athletic ability, right? That's somewhat god given. But all those other things can turn someone with average athletic ability into a reliable receiver. So. I just like the guys that run the routes, how they're taught so that we're on the same page. Do you run a seam stop and you're supposed to come down your stem, but then you curl up towards me? I just am going to hold the ball an extra count because I don't trust you as a receiver. And that extra count is usually the difference between getting hit or completing it or not. And so those guys end up being on the field more that know what to do first and foremost. And then the free, I mean, obviously there's just, some freakish athletic ability out there that makes these guys like Tyree Hill is just unbelievable to watch. Yeah, so that too, that helps. John, you're now with the Bucks, and they've hired Dave Canales as the offensive coordinator. I have a couple of friends that worked with him at the Seahawks and they rave about him. What are some things that you've learned under Dave during your time with him in the off season? Uh, I think he had a lot of, lot to do with some, some of Geno Smith's success and Geno Smith from everything I've heard is, is an extremely hard worker. So a lot of, Props to him for the year he had last year. Um, but he's got a great feel for the room, positive guy, connects with his players. And then uh, he's got some interesting coaching points about the position that are just fresh to hear and, and get his perspective on it. So I think he's got a ton of potential. I have a lot of respect for how he's installed the offense thus far. And I'm just excited to see him continue to uh lead us as an offense. John, um, what's one of your favorite passing concepts to operate? Let's go three by one. You're in a bunch. You're going to fly motion number one, and he's not. you're not going to snap it behind the quarterback. He's going to clear. And then while he stays on the run, he's going to turn up the field and run like a, a go ball or a blazer, like off the inside edge of the numbers versus quarters. The singled up guy who now has become number two after that late snap fly motion is running like a push through, right? Where he's clearing out the top safety or versus man, he can kind of run across the field, um, right? So you've got fly motion, go ball. X is now over here. Z is striking a match with him underneath. 
So versus, you know, carry or three, you're clearing it out with these two, this guy's underneath, you got your back in the flat, keep the tight end in just because the reality of the NFL is you probably want six guys for a, a play action seven step. Then we teach that tackle too. Like it's called like a B out, right? Where they're hitting that D tackle and then in, and then helping double with the tight end, given a normal four down front structure, no pressure. So that's I think a good concept. Uh, you got answers versus most coverages. Probably don't love it versus six, but you can still hit the flat. Um, and it's got it's great versus quarters, great versus eight. Um, because you're clearing out that side of the field with those two verticals. Uh, so that'd be my one of my favorite play actions. So for our coaches that are coaching the quarterback position, what's one of the most undercoached aspects of quarterback play that if you're coaching quarterbacks now with all that you've learned that you would make sure you put up as a high priority? The number one thing would be understand biomechanically how to throw a football. And that is such a loaded response because that is so complicated. But the the best in the business, you know, some people are just naturally gifted. They can you know send their hip, uh, their arm spirals, they dissociate, and then they they rip the football. But for a lot of guys, that's not the case. They have to really work at that. I'm one of those guys. It's just trying to maximize what my body has. So there's ways to do that, and just be in tune with that. Right, read up on some stuff. You know, uh, there's, you know, I, I'm going to have an actually an app that's coming out that's that's hopefully going to be helpful with this. But uh, that's where I've been, gained so much. That's why I've stayed around the NFL uh, is, is because I've been obsessed with my throwing motion and just trying to help guys to understand, okay, there's a, not, not every throw motion is the same either, right? Because there's just some guys' eye, arms are longer, some guys' legs are longer, some, some guys have bigger torsos. So, but there's, a, there's some core principles that are essential to throw the ball with um, optimal velocity and, and accuracy. And so understanding those and just constantly working at those is, is part of my process and what I would encourage any quarterback coach to at least be adept at the basic biomechanics of throwing and how I can help my quarterback then do that on the football field. John, that's great stuff. John Wofford, currently with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Guys, be sure to watch him and root for him. He's he's wrote, written some blog posts. There's one on The Athletic that's out, outstanding. And as you heard on this podcast, he's a wealth of knowledge. And um, he's going to, like he said, going to come out with the app soon. That's going to uh, help guys with biomechanics. And this guy, after football's done, he's still going to contribute on some level. He's just got so much knowledge, and, and he's such a great guy. John, rooting for you this year, man. Appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on. Thanks so much, Dub. It was a great conversation. Here are our winning edge takeaways from this episode. So, Dub, I know this was another tough one to unpack and say, hey, I'm going to focus on these three things, but what do you have for us? Yeah, the first thing, John has been under one of the best play callers in the NFL, and then his quarterback coaches have been just elitist too. You know, they, they, I think his, his other one is now the current head coach with the Minnesota Vikings. And so he has a real unique perspective on being tutored and mentored by some of these guys. So I think the first takeaway was being an elite quarterback coach or play caller requires you to make sure you're putting the quarterback in a good play. And that's one of the things he credits McVay with. Your plays need answers for both man and zone. And you have to have a process that allows your quarterback to adjust concepts or routes along the, you know, the way and, and know how to change those and navigate those pace post-snap. So I think coaches need to make sure you examine – you know, how you're teaching your quarterback how to navigate plays, and you have to have a process to solve this. The second takeaway is that elite play callers have a calm demeanor on game day, and quarterbacks feed off the play caller's presence. And so as a play caller, getting into the zone or rhythm actually feeds the quarterback to get in that same mindset. And that's one thing that he said McVay does a really good job of. So I think we need to be aware of our demeanor during the game day process and during the game and understand how it affects the quarterback. My last takeaway and the biggest one was how the best offenses structure their plays with can calls, and they are basically building plays together in a string to give answers to the highest priority threats to the most anticipated look. So while this can be difficult to do in high school, I think there are ways you can simplify this process with tags and hand signals to adapt to different pre-snap looks at the line of scrimmage. And I think this is something that every play caller should study and try to emulate. Great stuff as always, and, and we continue on next week 
with another episode here of Accelerate Everything on the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. Again, thank you for all the work you're putting into this. Thanks, Keith. Be sure to go to coachingcoordinator.com for additional resources, blogs, and sign up for our weekly newsletter, which gives the best tips from the previous week. Follow us on Twitter at Coach K Grabowski.